months. Some people don't live it. Uh, hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to the next session um, of our training. And today we're going to be finishing off our custom our lightning experience customization, which I believe we got about halfway down through buttons. We were looking at list buttons when we broke up on on Monday. So we're going to finish that off today, and then I want to take us through data modeling as well. Um, I have posted the uh, the details and the recording from the other day onto the homework and recordings page. So if you want to find it, you just go to the link and go to homework and recordings and just click on it. And if you click on that top that topmost heading, it will show you this week's recordings. Whereas if you click in the drop down, it will show you all the previous week's recordings. So um, so we're on week four, believe it or not. I can't actually believe it. Um, Monday night session has been posted, session seven, list views, compact layouts, page layouts, and list buttons. And then I have posted three trailhead badges for your homework. One is to build an app, another is to customize a sales path, and the other is to practice customizing a Salesforce object. So hopefully you've all started working on that and are having some fun with it. Um, I, two are already done. Fantastic. Well done, Baba. Um, and we've got some homework that um, we're working on for you next week as well that's going to help you with some um, sharing and visibility work. Uh, the security super bad. Rob said, is that good? Is the um, sessions next week good for the security super bad? It should help you. Yeah. It should help you. Super badges are all about applying the knowledge that you have, and they don't give you any clues or any instructions you have to know. So, um, by all means, if you want a stretch challenge, definitely go for the super badge. Yeah, it is a bit hard. Um, there are harder ones. <laughs> I still haven't conquered integration yet uh, on the super badges. But um, but yeah, the, the security one is hard, but it's important. So there's your homework. Have fun doing it this week. Um, let's now have a look at where we were the other day and finish that bit off so we were at lightning experience customization if you can log into trailhead please as normal um by now i, I would expect all of you are logging in in advance before we start so that's good so um then search for lightning experience customization and we'll find the badge and we're going to finish it off quite a long one this one um but there are some some fairly difficult concepts in it. So let me just, my screen keeps going yellow, doesn't it? Let me fix it. You know what it is? It's because it wants to turn me into a pickle because I'm using I'm using snap camera. And I use it for, for laughs. Okay, yeah, snap camera. So USB face. Let's go for this one. Okay, right. So I'm going to keep one eye over here on the right for the chat and one eye over here for trailhead. So if I'm looking at the camera, you know I'm looking at trailhead. Let's go for it. So lightning experience customization. And we're going to jump straight to the section which is called buttons and links when it loads. Yeah, create custom buttons and links, which is the penultimate module within this trail. And we got about halfway down. We created a list button the other day. We um, we uploaded a document and we created a button and we added it to the related list for the energy audits against on the account record. So if you remember, we had the account page layout. Um, we went to the energy audits related list. We created the button. We added it. And then we had it so that it could um, spin up um, the audit guidelines. OK, so that's useful useful one. Now we're going to create a custom detail page link. And this is if this is actually how you um, create a very static link that will never change. And um, it, it's really kind of important because whatever you put in that link, you can make it dynamic. But um, whatever you put in that link, 
you will get the same result wherever you click wherever you click it from in uh, Salesforce and that's what makes it different to a URL field so you know you can create custom fields of type link you would use that if you want to put an individual link onto an individual record whereas this is all about putting a link on a page that you can always get to regardless of which record you're looking at hopefully that's made that clearer so um, so we're going to go ahead and do this challenge. Bear with me a sec. I'm going to go down to the challenge and I'm going to launch my Trailhead Playground. Okay. So I went to challenge and I clicked launch. La 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 la. Up you come. Because we're going to go ahead and try this. So custom detail page link. So from setup, we click Object Manager and then click Energy Audit. Okay, so we're going backstage, which means we're going to click the cog at the top once we're in Salesforce. And we're going to click Setup. So it's going to load up. And we're going to go to Object Manager. And we're going to find our energy audits. I'm going to use Quick Find because I'm lazy. Now, where, who, can anyone remember where we create our custom buttons and links? And it's going to seem like a really stupid question. <laughs> buttons and links, yes, absolutely. Thank you. So we're going to go to buttons, links, and actions. And we're going to create a new button or link. And we're going to call our link US Average Energy Costs. Okay. US Average Energy Costs. And then we're going to make sure that we select Detail Page Link as the display type. So, because remember, you have three options here. The last time we did a list button, um, this is for detail page buttons, which we don't really use anymore because we use actions instead. Um, but then this is where you put your links. Now, we've got to talk about what our behavior options are for um, our buttons and links. We can choose, and actually, this is really old because, you know, if, you won't have seen this layout for Salesforce before, but that's the layout I very, very much remember from when I first started, um, which was uh, pre-classic. Um, so it doesn't really, it doesn't actually really um, affect what we do anymore because we're using a new, excuse me, we're using a new inter, new user interface now. So, um, but this previously used to say like, okay, when you click this button, does it fill the whole screen? Does it fill part of the screen? Does it fill just a tiny bit of, the, does it create a pop-up? Um, or does it just, you know, create a black, create a screen that only shows what you're, put, what you're putting in that button? So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, but what we are going to do is just leave leave the two behaviors as they are. So we're gonna. So what that means is, when we click this link, it will just display the uh, URL in a new window. Now there are two, three options for the content source as well. So when you, so what, this is this is actually telling you what what do you want to do when you click this button? When you click this button, do you want to open up a link, uh, which could be a web page um, or another page within Salesforce? Do you want to run some JavaScript, which is how we used to make pop ups happen? Um, on the page before we had uh, the lightning experience, which is what you see now. Um, or you can open up a visual force page, which is a custom coded page that you can build inside Salesforce. And you can have that sitting behind a button. For these purposes, we're just gonna leave it as, as the URL. Um, URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator, 
which is which means a web address. So when you type in www.google.com, that whole thing is known as a URL. Um, so in the formula editor, we are going to point to a public website. So we're going to go to we're going to I'm going to copy and paste this into your into the chat so you can copy and paste it too without having to muck about. Uh, and we're going to put that in as our link. Right. Now, I now you can quick. So just like we said with with um, as we said with. Uh, page layouts sometimes you might be in this screen for a bit longer so you, and if your internet drops you don't want to lose the formula that you've started writing because sometimes people do write formulae in these links as well to make them dynamic for example if you're passing through a special user id into a public website and you know that it works on that web, it runs a search for that website and you're passing through that search term so that no one else, so that the user doesn't have to then you might pass in, you might actually create a formula that does that. Um, so there's a quick save option uh, down here, and then there's a save option. There's also a preview option, and there's a check syntax option. And check syntax options, um, you'll see this button for, um, for formula fields as well. And it's a way of checking whether what you've put in there as a formula actually is going to work. And it displays any errors so that you can fix your formula. I'm just going to quick save because I don't want to lose it. And saving validates the URL, so it will basically check it while you save it. So you see here, it says uh, no syntax errors in merge fields or functions. So it's another way, it's a way of saving what you've done and also checking the syntax. So we're just going to save it, because we know that works now. I think I've zoomed in too far, actually. I can't see what I'm doing. OK. And that has now created that button. Now, if I, what's going to happen if I go to the energy audit and look for that button? Am I going to see it there? That's right, Samira. So it won't be there. What do we have to do next? We have to update it by the page layout. So we're going to go to our page layouts. And we're going to go to our, I believe we've in the last, yeah, we in the last module, we actually assigned ourselves the energy audit sales layout. So we're going to go to that one. And we're going to hit edit. And do you remember the page is the page layout editor is split into several sections. And the first section is where you can find your fields, your buttons, your links, anything that you want to drag onto the layout underneath, which is down here. So we now have to drag our button down. So we're going to go to, um, we did it as a link, didn't we? So we're going to go to custom links. And we are going to drag our link. Just click on it once and drag it down and put it under custom links. Let me just check that that's where we're supposed to put it. Yes, that's where we're supposed to put it. And then we save it. And that will save the editor and it will close the editor itself. So now that we've added it to the page layout, we should now be able to see it on our energy audits. So I'm going to go to my app menu, my app launcher, my nine dots in the corner, and I'm going to start typing. And then I'm going to click on energy audits, which is under the items menu. And I'm going to right click and open in new tab because I don't want to lose my, I might have to come backstage again in a minute. Okie dokie. I'm going to open up my fir the first energy audit that I find. Now let's see, do I have a link? Yes, I do. So you should now see that underneath created by and last modified by, you will see a link there that's called US average energy costs. So let's give that a click. And notice how it tells it tells Salesforce to redirect you to this page. And you can tell it not to warn you again if you want to. But this is if this is just telling you as a user, you're not in Salesforce anymore. You've left Salesforce. You're now in, you're now looking at this um, website here. Uh, 
and you can do that so you can do that for anything if you wanted to put in um let's say you've got a holiday request form and you wanted to create a custom link that will allow people to click on a holiday request form that's held within your works int intranet then you can do that um, but try and make sure that it's it's relevant to the context that you're looking at so at the moment we're looking at energy audits we don't really want to be putting a HR request link onto an energy audit necessarily, but we might want to go and look at benchmarks. We might want to go and look at a, a library that's full of previous audits. Um, we might want to go and look at the thought, um, some blogs with a specific with with thought leadership on it. These are all contextual um, items that you can give to your users that help make them better at their job. And that's really what we do as Salesforce um, admins. We are we are the roadies. We make sure that everything goes where it goes on smoothly, and we're not usually seen. So, so now you've got your your custom link, and that's all set up. So now we're going to go and try something else, something extra special, which is a custom detail page button. And this is where we can start getting funky and and passing dynamic information through, so that it automatically runs searches for you. So we're going to go back it back into our backstage area where it's uh, into our object manager and back to energy audit. So hopefully you haven't lost that page. Hopefully you still have it open. We're going to click buttons, links and actions again. And we're going to click new button or link. And this time we are going to change the display type. The display type is a detail page button. And if we look at what an example of that is, oh my God, that's really old. <laughs> this is pretty classic. So uh, now when you see edit, delete, clone, and find duplicates and so on, you will actually see a brand new button for yourself there. I've not seen that screen for such a long time. I feel really nostalgic. Okay, so what do we need to call this button? We're gonna call this button map location. We make sure we tick it as a detail page button. Now let's look at the behavior. The behavior, we it doesn't say anything. It's just going to be left as URL and display a new window. So now what you've got to do is paste this link into your formula. So I'm putting that into, into the chat for you so that you don't have to worry about it. Now let me talk to you about what this is doing here. It, you don't have to be able to read loads of code in order to understand what's going on here. All this is doing is when a user clicks the button, it's gonna, it's gonna send them off to Google and it's actually going to run a query. It's gonna pass the account address into your Google search so that when you open up maps, it will automatically open up the map on the address of the account that you're looking at. Make sense? Now, the way that it does that is through what's called parameters or merge fields. Account billing street is a merge field. Account billing city is a merge field. All you're doing here is you're saying, please pass through the address um, that belong that is on this account through to Google. Now, can anyone can anyone think about what will happen if I click that link and the account doesn't have an address on it? That's correct. It won't open anything. Um, it may well open Google, um, but it but it won't actually be a targeted um, view. And sorry, yeah, I'll explain. I'll explain. I'll explain that in just a second, Jeremy. So, um, so what you'll notice is, do you remember? So that's correct. If you if you don't if there is no data there, then it can't know, right? But if there's just a city there chances are it will open up just a map a view of the city uh, on the map instead of the actual address it won't focus down on the address um, now I just want to say something about these merge fields when we talk remember when we created uh, custom fields and we we set a label and then there's a second field that says API name the API name is the name of the field um, within the context of the database underneath. So the label is what users see and the API name is what is what the actual name of the field is. So you notice that it says account underscore billing city. 
and then you have curly brackets and you have an exclamation mark. Now, this is the notation that um, is used by developers when they're referring to fields in Salesforce. It's also used by us when we're merging fields into things like buttons, uh, things like formula fields and so on. So, um, and it's also into mail merge fields. Um, anytime that we want to put, anytime we want to push data into another, th in, into something, um, then it means that we c then then that exclamation mark and the curly brackets is how the, how we need to do it. So um, what we're going to do here is make a. Um, it's actually done all that for us, to be honest. Um, there are other ways that you you know you could do it the long way. And I've and I've created buttons before that back in the olden days. This was how this was the only way that you could pass data into fields automatically. Um, before that, what you could do is go to energy audit account account ID. You see what I mean? See what it's doing there? So, and this is how you could go in and pass information, pass other fields into it, in into different um, URLs and into formula fields and merges that uh, document merges. So. Thankfully, Trailhead has done all that for us. All Trailhead is doing is saying, here's the URL. We're going to run a query, which is Q equals. That's what Q equals means. Um, and percentage 20 is a um, is another way of representing like the and search parameters for the for Google. Okay. So we're going to pass through building street, city, state, and postal code. Uh, let me check. Okay, and then we're going to save it. And then we're going to add it to our page layout. And you're right, it does need to be done under account. Thank you for uh, clarifying that. I This is what happens when you haven't got your wits about you. You need to watch which object you're on. So I'm going to delete that. Thanks very much for spotting that. Well spotted. See, easy mistake to make. Yes, it does. It represents space between two words. I was just blagging because I'd forgotten what it meant. <laughs> Thank you, Baba. <laughs> no buttons, links, and actions. View button. Detail page button. It's called map location, isn't it? Yeah. And paste. I hope, sorry everybody, I did fly, did fly through that. So um, what we had to do is repeat that exercise, but on the account object rather than the energy audit object. So hopefully you all know how to get there by now. And then I'm going to save it. Thank you for your patience. Hit page layouts. And then I'm just going to go to the standard account layout and I'm just going to click the name of it because that will open up the page layout editor. And then I'm going to go to my buttons section. And I'm going to find map location. And I'm going to drag it down into the buttons section where it says account detail, you've got your standard buttons and then you've got another section for custom buttons. So I'm just gonna drop it in the custom buttons section and then I'm gonna save. And that's added it to the page layout. Now let's go and have a look at one of our accounts. So S Force, hopefully that will have an address on it. And I'm going to go to details. And it has no address. So let me see. Does it tell us to go to a specific one? OK. Now, what we have to just make sure is that we, when we click the drop down in the top right hand corner, you can then see your map location. So let's try out that example. If we've got no data, what do we see? Well, it opens up a new tab, it opens up Google Maps. 
and it doesn't show anything. It actually just shows that it shows my hometown. But if I put in, uh, well, I don't know, I just try something here. And thankfully, um, in many of these, you can actually look up an address while you're typing. Um, but if I put Salesforce Tower Mission Street, San Francisco, California, and hit save, and then go and run my map, let's see what it says. Let me click top right hand corner. Map location. Hopefully it should take me to San Francisco in one click. Boom, and there we go. There is Salesforce Tower, right next door to Okta, in the middle of San Francisco. Cool, huh? I quite like that. Okay, so the, if you can't see the button, then you, what you need to do is go to your drop down. So make sure it's on the page layout for a start and that you've added it to the correct page layout and that you're on the account object. Okay, so go to the account object, add it to the layout, and then you will be able to, when you come to front stage, you go to the drop down here and it's the last option that's available to you there. And there it is in all its glory. Okay, so are we ready for a um, another quiz? Uh, not a quiz. We're ready for a hands-on challenge this time. We're going to do it one more time just now when we do the um, exercise. But yeah, make sure you do it on the account object and not on the energy audit because that's where I messed up. And thanks to. Uh, Thanks to Natasha, who spotted quite correctly that, um, that it needs to be done on the account object rather than the um, energy audit. Okay. So let's have a go now at doing a button for the contact object. So, <laughs> Ralph is after creating a button. Yes, correct. So for the exercise, the hands-on exercise to pass the challenge, we need to actually then go and repeat this exercise, but for the contact. So we need to just go to, I'm going to copy that new, that link, and we're going to go to the contact object. And you can either get there through the object, um, the object manager, or you can get there, if you're front stage, you can go and open up the setup menu and click view object, and you can just get straight there from there. Edit object, and then get straight from there. This is how I end up with about 25 windows open. Okie dokie. So we are under object manager. We're going to go to buttons, links, and actions. And we're going to create a new button or link. This button needs to be called Google Info. Now, this is what, what this uh, button is going to do is we are going to open up Google and we're going to, if we're just going to pass through the name of the contact record that we're viewing at the time and it will just Google that person. Um, so this is also, this is a detail page button and we just need to paste the URL that we collected earlier. So the URL, which is posted into the chat for you as well. And all we're doing here is just passing through the contact name. I'm gonna check the syntax and just double check that it makes sense. And then I hit save. 
The next thing I have to do is go and add it to my page layout for the contact record. So I'm gonna to go to page layouts and I'm gonna visit the page layout that's called contact layout because I know that that's the one that is assigned to me at the moment. So I'm gonna go contact layout. And I'm going to go to buttons and I'm going to find my Google info button and I'm just going to drag it down into the buttons section underneath where it says contact detail and custom buttons and I'm just going to drop it there and save. And now it should be on a contact record. So let's go and have a look at Kathy Snyder. Now you can make this really, you can make this more specific. You could pass through um, the contact name plus a company name if you want to narrow down that search. And just to remember, and let your button is going to be shown under the drop down in the top right hand corner of your contact record. Now, if you don't want it there and you want to put it, you want to move it up a bit, what you can do is go back to the layout and you can just, oh no, you can't. Well, you can remove standard buttons that aren't going to be used. And I do this as a, as a regular thing. So if I know that I'm not going to be using check for new data, I just take it off the layout. If I don't want to ever use a start conversation, if I don't want to clone it, if I don't want to change the owner or view the hierarchy, I can just remove those buttons and that makes that that shortens that list for you, makes it a bit more manageable. And it's a way of making Salesforce a lot more relevant for um, it's a way of making Salesforce a lot more relevant for your users. So top right hand corner, you won't see your new your new button. You have to click the little drop down here and make sure that you're on the contact record for this challenge. And then scroll to the bottom and your button should be there. So you click Google info. Ah, OK, so yeah, so all uh, what you've done there. So all says my Google info was in the custom links, not button. This is where you have to be really careful about what um, what type of button you create. Because if I go back to the buttons, you get three options, remember? So you have to make sure that you remember that um, you click detail page button because it defaults to being a link. So if you went to create the new button and you left it as a link by accident, because this is what happens here, you see this middle section? where it says display type, detail page link, detail page button, list button. As default, it says detail page link. You have to make sure it says detail page button, which is the middle option. And then it will show up as a button at the top. And then I've been able to pass her name in. You see what happens here? It passes Kathy Snyder's name into, the, into Google, so I can then search for it. OK? So when you're ready, you can just click check challenge and hopefully you will have passed that section. I'm going to give you a moment just to complete that challenge and check it while I get some water. I'm just going to put my cat down to sleep for a little while. Okay, everybody, did you all get your badges?
or at least pass the module. Everybody okay with that one? Yay, well done. Congratulations. Anybody, anybody need a bit more time? No? Okay. So finally, this is the last bit, and then I think you'll all get a nice shiny new badge. Yeah, we're so close. So Hannah, when Hannah says, where do I look to see my new button? Uh, you see your new button if you go to a contact. So if you go front stage and just search for any of your contacts or click on the contacts tab and just open up anyone. In the right hand corner of the screen, there's a drop down. If you click that drop down menu, the last option is Google info. And then you click that and it will open up Google for you. Now that's just one of many ways that you can integrate with other systems. You could actually pass that data through to, let's say, an account system if you wanted to. You could create a button that says view account in SAP um, if you wanted to just make sure that all the data is up to date. Um, so you can do that with a button and pass that information through. Um, and there are other things you can do. You can use the button to uh, call to call a function in Salesforce that will then send a message to the other system with that whole contact information in one go so that you don't have to type anything in. There's loads of cool stuff you can do with it. So what's next? Our final module, uh, our final section of this module is empower your users with quick actions. Now this is fun, I like quick actions. Quick actions is how we like to do things um, and there's, there's and, and the reason that we would choose quick actions is if we want to pass, if we want to automate that button. If, if we want to, let's say that we create a button that opens up a form or says create something new and you don't want to make a user have to fill everything in in one go. Back in the day, we would use a custom button to do that. And then we would actually create, it would be a great big long formula field with all kinds of stuff in it that would open up the right records or pass data into the right fields. It's like a pre-filling, it's like a pre-filled form. The last thing that people want to do when they're filling forms in is, you think about how many times you get on your phone and um, you get, get your face with a really long form and you're just like, oh my God, it's going to take me like 10 minutes to fill this in. Well, quick actions are a really useful way to actually take a lot of that, uh, that burden away from users. And it's also another really good way to make sure that you have really good quality data as well. You could pass through a set value into a text field that's the same every single time. And what that means is your reporting will be more reliable because there'll be consistency. Let's say you've got the job title field. You could, and actually, let me think of a better use case. Let me let. So if you have um, an active checkbox on a contact to say that that contact is active and you want to def default it because if someone's adding a contact f new for the first time, then you would imagine that they are, it's because they are an active contact. Um, that they are, if they're effectively working at the account that you're creating. So rather than have users tick that box to say they're active, you could actually sit, have it sitting behind the button so that so that it's always ticked at the right time. You could also create a button that says, uh, or an action, sorry, that, that says um, this person has left. And then you could actually create a record that then pings off an automation. For example, there's loads of stuff you can do with these. So this in this, in this instance, um, when you think about have, a, um, have a chat with your users and ask them what um, they really wish they could do. Um, for example, you might create an emergency order action for a food service company that allows delivery drivers to immediately order extra or missing food items. And if you create actions that your users actually need, rather than just actions for the sake of having actions, um, then your users are going to be far more interested in using Salesforce and they're going to like it, they're going to love it, and they're going to they're evangelize it. Um, and that, and really, that's the secret to making making IT systems more effective. A lot of a lot of you have probably had to use IT systems before because we have to use it. S Salesforce is actually really quite lovable if it's set up correctly. And to set it up correctly, it's all about putting together something that users want to use and find useful. 
So there are two different types of actions. One is object specific actions. So that's when you create an action. An action is like a button, basically. Um, and you create it from a record, from an object. So if you, if you say, for example, I'm going to create a, I'm either going to create a record that's related to a contact or I'm going to create, um, no, that's a, no, I'm, yeah, don't worry, I was overthinking. Um, an object specific action is where you can create or update records within the context of that object. So if you want to create a contact, but you want to add a certain, uh, great example actually, I have an object specific action in our Ladies the Architects org because we track whenever people have passed certifications because we like to reward them. So our object specific action is called new cert. And when you click on it, it opens up a, a form where you literally just put in the name of the certification that they got and um, and the date that they got it, and then you save it. And that means it's really easy to do it on your mobile. You just tap, enter, enter, tap, done, finished. But it creates the object underneath uh, and automatically relates it to the contact, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, there are different types of object-specific actions. You can have actions that create records that are automatically associated with the record that you started from which is the example I've just talked about. You've got update record actions, which makes it quick and easy for people to edit records. I have an example of that too. In our Ladies Be Architects org, we have got a uh, button that says update mailing address. Uh, because our contact records are actually quite long, we've got lots of fields and lots of things we track on them. So rather than clicking edit and waiting for it to open up and then scrolling down to that bit, People do get quite lazy with stuff like that, and that's fine because it's if it's a long job, it's you're less likely to do it. So I've created a an update record action that's called update address, and all it does is you click it and up pops there's a pop up that arrives and you just fill in the address and save it, and all that does is just updates that contact record. You could do it just as easily if you clicked edit. It's just that you would have to scroll down a lot more. Uh, log a call actions so they help users add notes about calls meetings and interactions we used to call those interaction logs uh, back in the day um, we can also create actions that kick off flows flows are a way of automating things um, there are there are also ways of guiding users through specific processes that are really important like setting up an account in an accounts package or creating an invoice you can guide people through that process where and if you think about those experiences where you might click um let's say you're you're applying for um and i've seen this actually used this concept used on the uk government website if you're applying for benefits for welfare um you can click start and then it will ask you a question then you click next it'll ask you a question then you click next it'll ask you a question then you click next then it will display everything that it knows about you and say is this correct and you've got a last chance to change it that's example of what people use flows for in salesforce so we we can use it for call scripts um so if somebody phones up a call center and like you imagine uh, nhs 111 in the uk um, which is a helpline that you can contact if you're not well and you just want some medical advice. Um, these actually have specific, they have different outcomes depending on how you answer those questions. So you can create those call scripts for contact center users to follow and you have those sitting behind an action. Um, we, then, we can then have object specific send email actions. They're only available on cases and they are a way of uh, giving users access to a simplified version. That was a bit of a wordy description. Um, a simplified version of the case feed email action in the Salesforce mobile app. I think we'll look at that later. Um, the other type that you have um, for actions is global actions. And global actions are where they're not in context. A global action might be send an email. Whereas an object specific action might be send an email to this contact. Does that make sense? Or send an email from this opportunity. So they live in a special layout on their own. They've got a glo uh, what's called a global publisher layout. There's no object that's associated with it. Okay. So you can use. So we're going to go ahead and try creating some of these. We used to call them quick actions. Um, 
and you know but it's important to understand the difference between the two so global uh global is so sitara says global action could you specify an object or not no that's the point so global sits across the top sits across all objects whereas object specific ones sit on an object okay and we're going to go through that right now so first of all we're going to create an object specific action so in the context of our energy audits she want maria wants to give her users an, an, an easy way to create them she's going to create an object specific action that lets her users create energy audits right from the account record okay so she doesn't have to scroll down and find the related list and click new she can just click a button top left hand top right hand corner it'll be automatically related just fill in a couple of bits save and done okay so we're going to go um, and create this action and we're going to create a new object specific action add it to the account page layout and then customize what actions people see on account records just to simplify the experience for them so we're going to go back to backstage let me close down the other windows i don't need right now and i believe i'm backstage on the account which is great so we are so make sure that you're in object setup object object manager and account hopefully this is starting to feel a bit more familiar to you now that you can see where you are and what you're looking at um we're going to go to buttons links and actions again and this time we are going to click new action Now this action type is going to create a record, but you see there's other things you can do here. You can send an email, you can log a call, you can open up a visual force page, which is a page that you've written yourself in Salesforce. You can have it update your record. You can even have it open up a lightning component, which is another coded page, or you can have it run a flow, which is the call scripting example I talked about a moment ago. We are going to use uh, the create a record action type and we're going to and this is where we have to say what kind of object we're going to create so this looks at all of the records that are related to the account so you'll see you can actually have it create another account and you could pass through that account as being the parent I, I might create I might call that action add add subsidiary and that would make it really easy because some people really struggle with the idea of relationships between accounts. Whereas if you just had a button that says add subsidiary, people know that if they click that and they fill in the details, they're already creating the hierarchy themselves. One use case. In this instance, we are going to create a new energy audit. The label we're going to give it is new energy audit. And create feed item is important because um, what that does is, in ch is it creates a chatter post so that if you create the record, it will post a chatter to say, Gemma created an energy audit. Um, some people hate that kind of noise, so you can untick it if you want. Uh, you can also have a success message that says, you know, congratulations, you made an energy audit. Now, all we're going to do here is just save it. Pardon me. And now we've created our action and now we get to have some fun with it. We get to change the layout. Now this will look familiar to you because we've been looking at page layouts, right? So what you do here is remember I said about um, when you click an action, it will pop up with a very simplified form uh, where you can just fill in the data and then save it and it'll create the record. This is where you change your layout for that. And they don't like you to have too many fields on this. They like you to make it as quick and succinct as possible. So for this one, what do we need to have to add? We need to make sure that we have energy audit name, cost, energy usage, and account. So name, cost. So we're going to drag that up so it's in the right order. Energy usage and account. Because it will probably get angry with me if I save it and it's in the wrong order. So just checking. So obviously they all have red asterisk, which means they're required fields. Okay. Um, if you take it off, if you take a required field 
off, then users can't complete the action. And this is why it's really important when you create your fields to really generally consider, is it really important for this field to always be filled in? Do I want to, do I want, because, you know, whatever decisions you make around your conflict, your, your config will have an effect in other parts of the system. So, and as you become more familiar with this sort of thing, the what seems like a very small thing becomes more important when you consider how how much you want your users to like the system. Anyway, I'm going to leave those as they are. And then I'm going to, so, and then they're saying also in, in it says, audit notes and types of installation are fields that could be populated after it's created. Okay, so think also about how much is necessary, how much data is necessary to be filled in right now and how much could be filled in later. Bearing in mind that you are taking a bit of a risk with that because users will often forget to go and fill it in and then all of a sudden you've got no data to show in your report. So think carefully about what you want it to be, what you want to be required. Notice if I drag audit notes over, I also get the option to make it required on the page layout just like I would with a record one of my favorite features. So I'm going to save that. So now, whenever I, and, and now that I want to bring your attention to one other thing, which is I, I, I absolutely love because you could never do this before. You couldn't pre-populate fields without code. Whereas now you can actually create predefined field values so that when you click your action and it comes up with that layout, there's data already in it. And that's one of my favorite things about this. And, and that's how you can put things in context. So for example, if you were on an opportunity and you wanted to create an action called create renewal opportunity, you could create an action saying create renewal and then pre-populate the amount um, multiplied by 10% if, it's an up, if you're applying an uplift for the year. You can pre-populate the type as being existing business or renewal. You could populate the account, you could pre-populate the name, you could pre-populate the close date to be one year on from the previous one. There's all kinds of really cool stuff you could do there. And that's all just, it, back in the day, they'd have to click new, enter in all the data, or someone would have to load it in, or someone would have to run a script that would create all the renewals for them. Whereas now they can just click a simple button for the renewal. So we're gonna then, we're going to save that. Now we have to add it to our page layout, just like everything else. So we're going to hit page layouts. And we're going to go to our account layout. And with actions, this is where it can get a little bit fiddly. We have two sections where we can add actions. One is um, we have the mobile, and actually, sorry, I'm going to be quiet. Uh, quick actions in Classic. We don't use Salesforce Classic anymore. So what you now need to do is um, look at this section here. All the actions on your page layout have a section, but they're all predefined by Salesforce, by the global publisher. So if you want to make sure that this action appears for every single object, then you can actually put the action in the global publisher, and then it will add, automatically add that action to this list. But you can override them per object and per page layout. So I'm gonna click the little, you can override the predefined actions. And oh, look at all of these, you get loads. But this is where you basically add your new action. So to do that, I'm gonna to go to mobile and lightning actions in, in the top of, of my field navigator. I'm gonna scroll down to mobile and lightning actions. And then I'm gonna bring in my new energy audit action that I've just created. So I'm gonna click on it and I'm gonna hold it down and I'm gonna bring it here and I'm just going to put it there let me just check that that's exactly what I had to do oh good yes haha -ha. right then it says let's do a bit of cleanup because there are so many actions on there so we're going to take some actions off the page layout and I'm going to post in the chat which actions you need to um, remove so we're going to remove uh thanks yeah goodbye thanks okay we're going to remove thanks we're going to remove question where's question if you can't find it just come up here find the action click on it and it will show up yellow down here 
useful tip. Uh, sharing. Sharing. Oh, look, you can do it that way too. Uh, change record type, we're going to get rid of. Okay, my computer is glitching on me. Quick save as you go. Don't forget to quick save. Last thing I want is to lose all this stuff. So, Natasha, what you should have, because you won't be able to change it, you scroll down a bit, and you should see a blue link under Salesforce Mobile and Lightning Experience that says override predefined actions. And then it should allow you to change them. Uh, change record type. Yeah, that's gone. Get contacts. Okay. And send text. So funny story. My friend actually wrote the, um, the send text functionality for Salesforce. She wrote the code for it. Um, for her, when she worked at her previous company, and then her previous company sold good sales to Salesforce. <laughs> it's just business. So, uh, so yeah. Um, Natasha, have you been able to change it yet? Can you see the override link? Okay, good. Thank you. So once you're done, just remove all of those actions that I've put up there at dead on nine o'clock. Quick save, don't forget. And once you and just do one more quick check because if you fail your um, if you fail your uh, challenge a bit later, then um, it's possible then it's possibly because you've missed something. So just make sure that you have covered it all. So I'm going to click save and that will close it. Right. Now, we can now easily create an energy record that's automatically associated with an account. So let's go and have a look on the account record and we should now see, uh, what's it called? Uh, new energy audit across the top next to new contacts. So let's go and have a wee look at that. So back to my app launcher. I'm gonna open up contacts. Well, why is it doing it in the same window? That's annoying. I'm just going to open backstage in my new window. Back to Kathy Snyder, our lovely friend at TNR Corp. We're almost, we're almost there, guys. Home stretch. The badge is forthcoming. Okay, top right-hand corner, we should see, I've done it on the wrong item. Yes, it should be on accounts, thank you. <laughs> Back to S-Force, our old friend. Well spotted, guys. And now we should have a button, or an action, sorry, that says new energy audit. And up it comes. What's the name? What's the cost? What's the kilowatt hours? And it has automatically related it to the account. Okay. And I'm just going to save it and it's done. And when I look at the related list and look at the energy audits, there's my new one. So it's just a really, really quick way to do it. Anyone need help? Okay, now hopefully, so there's a couple of things to note. So even though their actions, email, log a call, new event, and new task don't show up here, and that's because they are underneath the activity tab. So they are treated differently. Um, and then your standard chatter actions like post, making a new post or creating a new poll appear on the chatter options as well. So I'm going to pause 
Hannah, can I help in any way? So you can go to, so Orla, what you can do is, Samira says, is you go to any account record, provided you've added it to the page layout, remember, and you've saved it, and you should see the action on the account record. Okay, we can go through it again. Does anyone else want to go through it again? We have some time. So what you do is going back to backstage, I'm going to the account object. And I go to buttons, links, and actions. So I'm clicking on account. And then on the left, you've got buttons, links, and actions. And then you click new action, unless you've done it already. Then you are presented with this page, which is, OK, What? What? this is going only going to create an object-specific action. That's why you create it from the object that you're doing it for. So the action type is create a record, and the target object is energy audit. And then you give it a name, which is new energy audit. Okay. Then once you've saved that, you change your layout, um, and then you go to your page layout. Sorry, you change your action layout. Then you go to your page layout. You go to the account layout which is the layout at the bottom, because that's what we're all added to. And then what you will see, if you haven't added it to the page layout yet, you might see that this there's a section here. So you've got the, you've got the highlights panel, quick actions in Salesforce Classic Publisher, which just ignore because we're not using Salesforce Classic. Uh, then you've got Salesforce Mobile and Lightning Experience Actions. Now, if you haven't, added anything to this yet, you might see this box is all in yellow and you don't see all these actions here. Um, but if you do see a yellow box, you should see a blue link within all that writing that's within that box that says override, that you can override the, um, the global settings. So you click that and it will show you all these actions here. Then what you do is you go to your quick actions. So remember at the top here, you've got all your fields and everything. Well, there's a section called mobile and lightning actions. So you click that and then you just click and drag. Where is override? Okay, so the override, I'll show you on a different page layout because I think that will still be there. So account support layout. It's a one-off thing that you only see once. So here where it says Salesforce Mobile and Lightning Experience Actions, it says actions in this section are predefined by Salesforce. You can override the predefined actions. If you hover over that, you'll see it's a link. So then you click that link like this. And it will show all of the actions that are predefined by Salesforce. So what you've got to do then is find your new action, which is under quick action, uh, mobile and lightning actions, sorry. And then you find your new energy audit and you drag it down. Then what you have to do is to delete the other ones that aren't relevant. So like you can delete the thanks, uh, wherever that is, where is thanks? Yeah, so you can delete thanks. And you just click and drag it. Uh, you can remove question. And I can't see it for looking, so I'm going to just click up here and it will highlight it in yellow so I can find it. So just pick that up and drag it. That's where it gets really funny with me. Anyway, so when you're done, you just, when you, you've got rid of all of your irrelevant actions, you just save it. Now make sure you've done it on the layout that on the page layout that says account layout, this bottom one here. Because that's the one. Because if you go to page layout assignment, that's the one that's assigned to your profile as a system administrator. And once you've added that, all you have to do is go back to front stage and go to accounts and just pick up any account from your list. So I'm going to pick up Gene Point this time. 
And then you should see your new action up in the right hand corner here. So it's not in the drop down. That's where your buttons are. Your actions are shown here. So I can now create a new energy audit and it will pop up with a box with three boxes, three fields in it. And I can add whatever I want. And then save it. And that's it done. Yes, you can preview the page as another. Um, so all I said, what is the preview as button for? Um, it's the ability to preview the page as another user um, profile, as Samira was saying. Why does the top left of my screen say energy consultation? Because that's the app that I'm in at the moment. So the other day when we were, I think last week, we, we built an app that was called Energy Consultation. You should still be able to get to it regardless of what app you're in because you're looking at the account object. So the account object is what you've configured to put your new energy audit in. Okay, your button's still not showing up. Right, okay. I think we'd have to look at that in more detail to understand why you can't see your button because it should be there unless you put it on a different page layout. If you put it on a different page layout, you won't see it. So you need to make sure that you've got it on the right page layout, which is the bottom one in the list. Okay, so it's definitely on the bottom. Okay. So without looking at it, I can't really advise, unfortunately. Um, but we can always have a look later. So, Okay, so now that we've done that, we now can go ahead and create a global action. Can we edit the button? Yes, we can edit the button. We can edit the button whenever we want. Um, you just go back to your account, go back to your buttons, links and actions, and you can make adjustments to it anytime. No worries, Hannah, congratulations. <laughs> Not a worry at all. So You've now created detail buttons, you've created a link, you've created a object specific action. We're now gonna create, the final step is to create a global action. And the global action is where it's not related to a specific option, uh, sorry, um, object. So it's nothing to do with accounts or contact, it's just create something. It doesn't matter which object it's related to. So the example that we're gonna be working on for this one is a new campaign. And we, I've mentioned campaigns, but I haven't gone into them in great detail. Um, happy to follow up on that, actually. I think we will need to look at campaigns a bit later on when we start looking at different routes to go down. Um, so, a glow, so in this instance, in, trail, in our Trailhead badge, the sales team has asked Maria to create an action that allows users to create a campaign, no matter where they are in Salesforce. A global action is the best way to do this because it appears the global actions menu appears at the top of every single page, not just the object. OK, so whereas if it's an object specific page and you're on an account, you won't see your new but you won't see your new action. Some questions. So Baba has a question. Um, OK, I'm not sure what the question is. If you're trying to remove. Yeah, hello. Hiya. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm sorry, but I'm just uh, kind of lost. So I tried to remove. I, I tried to remove thanks. I forgot to remove it earlier. So when I went back and tried to remove it, it's not giving me an option to edit the button. Oh, right. Yeah. No, because those are standard yeah. buttons. You shouldn't be editing. You can't edit the button because that's just given to you by the platform. Whereas any anything that you have created yourself, you're then able to to edit. Does that make sense? Some stuff you can't change because yeah. it's different to you. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. So we're going to create one. We're going to do one more thing. We're going to create a global action uh, because there's a there's a requirement for users to create a campaign no matter where they are in Salesforce. Apparently, they love campaigns. So we're going to go to global actions. And to, to get there, 
we have to come out of our of, of our object manager because this has nothing to do with accounts, contacts, opportunities, campaigns, anything. This is happening at the application level. So we're going to go to home. And in our quick find, we're just going to type in the word glob. And that will bring up the menu. So there will bring up a couple of menus. One is the publisher layout, which is where we talked about you know what are the standard buttons that everyone gets regardless of where they are so that's the publisher layout and then there's the global actions and that's what we're going to create now so i'm just going to click on global actions and you'll see here are all the actions that are available uh, across the board so you can log a call from anywhere provided you've put your action on the global publisher layout you can create a new chatter group from anywhere or a new lead or a new note or a new opportunity or a new task, provided they're all added to the global publisher layout. Clear? Okay. So our, we're going to create a new action, which is new campaign. So we're going to hit new action. And what do we have to call it? Create, uh, we have to create, call it create new campaign. So the action type again is create a record and then target object is campaign. And we're just going to call it new campaign. And again, we get the same, pretty much the same um, options as you would get for the uh, object specific actions, where you can choose whether it creates a feed item, you can choose the icon, you can choose a success message, you can, you should put a description in um, as you go. And I'm just going to hit save, and then you will again get the same experience as you did for the object specific action, you will have to create, you will have to update the layout. So that when people click new campaign, you have to choose what fields they have to fill in. So let's see what Trailhead wants us to do. Trailhead would like us to lay out our layout like this. So we have campaign name on the left, we have active on the left, we have type and the dates, the campaign name active, type and dates. So that means we've got to move parent campaign over here. See what I did there? I just clicked and dragged. Uh, quick check. We need the, okay, so actually we don't need parent campaign at all. We need description over on the right hand side. And to get rid of parent campaign, we can click it and drag it up here. Or you can do what I prefer to do, which is use this little icon, this remove icon. I, that's my favorite way to do it. Just quicker. Then we need to drag down expected revenue in campaign and campaign owner. So the reason that people use campaigns is to track um, several things, actually. You can use it to track the fact that you went to um, a conference and you can track, you can add, start adding people you spoke to at the conference as campaign members so that you can then follow up if you get any opportunities as a result of that campaign you can actually um, link it you can link those opportunities to the campaign and therefore see how much revenue you expect to get from it so it helps people to measure their return on investment events are another really good um, use case for campaigns because you can put in the cost of the event and then if you um, make any further sales from that event, you can link them back to the as, to the event as being a source. So you know how much you can get a, a good return on investment figure for that. Um, let me see. Campaign name, active type, start date, end date, expected revenue, description, and owner. Let me just check. Expected revenue, owner, description. Right, I need to swap that round. Everyone clear? So hopefully you've all configured your layouts here. Name, active, type, start date, end date on the left. Expected revenue, campaign owner and description on the right. Let's just check. The only field that needs to be required is the name. So we're good like that. And then we click save. Is everybody with me? I assume if, if there's no questions, then I assume we are. So then we save that. And what do we have to do next? We have to go to the global publisher layout and we have to add our action to the publisher layout. So I'm gonna go back to home. And, oh look, 
because I started using the quick find, it hasn't forgotten my, um, my the last thing I searched for. So I can now get to the publisher layouts. So I'm going to click publisher layouts. And you'll see that you, there are several versions you can create. So you can you can actually assign different action groups to different profiles. So let's say you, you have sales support, you might want to give them options to really quickly create or edit or update things that they just that only they need to update. Whereas with, um, you know, so you can create, you could create loads of these. You shouldn't, but you can. So I'm just going to edit the global layout. And I'm, all I'm going to do is add the new campaign action to the global publisher list. And it's the same thing again. We have to override our predefined actions just like we did before. This is like a one-off thing. Uh, so we're going to scroll down to where it says Salesforce mobile and lightning experience actions. We're going to, and we we can see there's a link that says you can override the predefined actions. So we're going to click that. And then we're going to find our mobile and lightning action that we created, which is called new campaign. And we're going to click on it and we're going to drag it down into this second section here, which is the mobile and lightning experience actions. And once you've done that, you just click save. Everybody with me? Cooly cool cool. And now when we go back to our main view, if we go to home, might see an action called new campaign which we don't hear where are we going to see it check out ah yes we're going to see it up here so up here is where you get to your global actions up in the top right hand corner you've got a plus sign that's it so click the plus sign oh no because of the demo, where is the global action? Where is my new action? Oh, refresh the page first. Refresh your browser page. <laughs> Click the plus sign. And there's our new campaign. And up it comes. And you see how easy it is to just set that up. We could set that up as Dreamforce. Expected revenue, billions. Active means you can add people to it. It is a conference. If those are the right dates, I really am sad. And then we save it. And there we go. It's been done. It's been created just like that, very quickly. And we can click on it and we can go and do whatever we want with it after that. Okay. Now let's we the final thing we have to do is a quiz. No. Oh, sorry. I just clicked the button. That nearly took me out of this. So the final thing, is everybody ready for this? Your badge is so close, so close. It's within your grasp. So question number one, everybody ready for this? Custom actions help your users by A, allowing them to create custom records. B, giving them more ways to open, view, edit, and delete custom records. C, making work feel more like playing a video game. D, making it fast and easy to interact with information in your organization. <laughs> yeah. 
Samira has a question. I assume you say you shouldn't be creating multiple global publisher layouts because it is best practice to use user profiles to determine which which of each user type of users see. Is that correct? Um, I say that you shouldn't be creating multiple ones. Um, you can. I mean, um, actually, my question was, uh, sorry, my comment was a fairly flippant way of saying don't create too many. Because if you are creating too many, that perhaps suggests to me that you've got a lot, a lot of users coming to you wanting their own single views and you're saying yes to them. And actually, it's if you have just a small number of them, it shows that you have considered carefully what actions are being created and what for and who for. So does, does that answer your question? Afshan says it's not letting me add new campaigns in the lightning, right? Okay, it definitely should. You have to click the plus sign in the top right hand corner. Refresh, make sure you've refreshed your browser first. So if you're on a Mac, do Command and R. Um, if you're on Windows, just do Control R. Okay, question number two. The main difference between object-specific actions and global actions is A, object-specific actions have automatic relationships to other records and global actions don't. B, global actions perform actions outside of Salesforce and object-specific actions only perform actions inside Salesforce. C, object-specific actions perform actions only on specific objects. Oh, my God. And D, you can use object specific actions wherever actions are supported in Salesforce. This is a cheeky one, isn't it? Okay, because two of those could be right. Three, to see a custom object specific action on the palette of the page layout editor, A, click layout properties on the page layout editor. B, select mobile and lightning actions in the list of element types. C, first customize the action in the action layout editor. And D, or D, select quick actions in the list of element types. Okay, you ready, everybody? I want to see some woohoos because you should all be getting badges when you get this right. Hopefully, we are all getting confetti. <laughs> Shiny. Well done, Kat. Is anyone struggling? We can talk. <laughs> well done, Samira. Is anyone struggling? We can talk it through. <laughs> okay. So the second question, yeah, it is a bit awkward because it's very wordy and very long answers. So the main difference between object specific actions and global actions is remember that. When you're looking at an object specific action, you're able to create a record that's related to that one. Whereas a global action, you can create a record that's not related to any other records from anywhere in the system. Does that make sense? So I think I would probably pick, I would probably pick A for that one. Although C I believe could also be true because it, does perform actions only on specific actions but it but i think that what's wrong about c is that it doesn't talk about what global actions do so some, sometimes the question's wrong purely because there are missing words in the answer it can be like that in the exams as well <laughs> okay Take a moment, take a breather really quickly because in the last half an hour, we're going to talk about data modeling. And I'll be right back.
we all smashed it? <laughs> Okie dokie. Well, well done, everybody. So you've got through quite a long badge. That took us three sessions to get that badge, but that's it was absolutely packed with different concepts. So let's have a quick review of what we've done. So in this, in this um, badge, you've set up your org. You have created a lightning app. You've done list views. You've done compact layouts. You've done page layouts. You've done buttons and links, and you've done quick actions. You've done more than um, than a lot of people would do in their first week or first first four weeks of working with Salesforce. So, what you have actually mastered so far is how you can just all the different ways that you can twist Salesforce to do what you want it to do, um, re really easily, um, and. You know, at some point in the future, I'm going to set you a small project to go and build your own application um, using some of these concepts. And you can always come back and forth into into Trailhead um, to play with those and, and relearn them. So on this last piece, um, I do have one more badge that I wanted to do with you um, before we break for the week and we and we meet next week to talk about sharing. Um, because so far we've talked about all the different we talked about custom fields, custom objects. We've talked about um, sharing and visibility. Um, but something else that I want to go through actually is um, objects, fields, and relationships really quickly. And we should be able to get through that fairly quickly because you've now been creating custom objects. And now I'm going to show you a different way to create them rather than going through the, um, through the uh, object manager. OK? so. Understanding custom and standard objects. Can anyone, can any, if I shout out the name of, a, of an object, um, can you shout back and tell me if you think it is a standard object or a custom object? Okay. So, uh, leads. Are, are leads a standard object or a custom object? That's right. They're a standard object. Timesheets. That's right, they are a custom object. Somebody's created that. What about tasks? That's right, they are standard objects. What about ooh, energy audits? That's right. Now, if I'm looking at, if I'm, uh, if I'm looking, if I'm an object manager and I'm looking at a list of objects, how can I tell whether an object is a standard object or a custom object? That's correct. Your custom objects will have double underscore C after it, and it's the same for fields. If I want to relate two objects together, what type of field would I need? That was a bit more of a of a of a cheeky one. So Afshan got it right. You can have a lookup field to relate two objects together. You can also have a master detail field to relate two objects together, and that creates a parent and child relationship. Um, I just want to I just actually want to talk about field dependencies, which is something that Baba has has brought up. Field dependencies are when you have two drop down lists and one is dependent on the other. So for example, if you have um, a field called country. Uh, which is a pick list, and then you have um, subregion as a second pick list. You can actually create a dependency between the two so that when you click on UK, you only get UK counties as a subregion. When you click on US, you only get states as a subregion. Okay, so um, it's, a, it's a way of managing those dependencies. So we're going to talk really quickly about. Um, Custom objects. We, we're going to create have have another go at creating one more custom object, and in this instance, this is about. Um, in fact, some of this should be maybe I sh maybe I should send this as homework, guys, because we've already done this in a previous session. So, I think I will do that. Um, I do want to have a quick talk about something else: uh, formulas and validations. Uh, sorry, changing the game a little bit. I don't think there's any point going over stuff that we've been over before. You clearly have learned stuff um, from all of that. 
So I want to talk to you about, um, <laughs> you okay? <laughs> um yeah this is this is perfect actually this is showing the next the next logical step so you've created custom objects you've looked at different um relationships and ways to relate things together now i want to talk to you about formula fields and formula fields really do get interesting um formula fields are when you have a lot of data in your organization your users need to understand data at a glance without doing calculations in their heads they can, formula fields can be hard but they don't have to be that's the thing um, they can be very, very simple. For example, you want to look at a cost rate for a timesheet. So you create a custom object called timesheet and you put in Monday hours, Tuesday hours, Wednesday hours, Thursday hours, etc. And you put in a, a, num a currency field called cost rate, which is an hourly cost rate, say one pound an hour. A formula field could be Monday's cost. So it'd be whatever the number of hours that someone puts into Monday multiplied by the cost rate. So that'd be eight pounds. And then you can have another formula field at the end that adds all of those together for the week and gives you a total cost for that um, timesheet. That could be a simple way of doing it. Where they get really interesting is where you've got nested if statements, and that's where I get I get rather excited. Um, but there's also some best practices around formulas as well, around making them really easy to read. Sometimes I log into someone's org, look at a formula field, and everything's just written in constant lines, and you're just like, what's going on here? So there are things that you can do to split up your formula and make it easier to read. So I'm gonna show you that. If you wanna take two numeric fields on a record and divide them to create a percentage, you can use a formula field. If you want to create a, um, I've used formula fields to actually identify who, who, to send, um, who to send a record to for approval, for example. Um, in fact, that's a common one that I used to use for timesheets. And I used to create formulas in there that would say, is this, is this, um, is this timesheet ready to be exported to an accounts package? And in my formula field, I might say, has it been approved? Um, are all the hours correct? Is there something, um, I might create a custom field with a, with, with a, that's set by a, an automation that says, is the right stuff attached to it? And if, if it is, then it will say yes. And you can put your formula field to that. And then in your approval process, say, if that formula says it's OK to do it, then off it goes kind of thing. So there's loads of, loads of logic that you can use. You can also take two dates, calculate the number of days between them. Or you could have a contract, for example, where you have a start date and you have a term and then you want it to calculate the end date. You can do that with a formula field. Um, let's look at an example. If you want to calculate how many days are left until an opportunity's close date, so create a days to close field. Um, then you can actually calculate that. You just you just subtract one from the other. Um, so let's have a quick go at this one. So we're going to go into uh, back into our org, and we're going to go to opportunity. So we're going to go to the setup. We're going to go to object manager, and we're going to go to our opportunity object. And you're going to create your first formula field. We're going to create a brand new field. In opportunities are you all following along good okay object manager then opportunity and I don't want to scroll so I'm just going to type up and then I'm going to click opportunity I don't like scrolling then I'm going to go to fields and relationships and I'm going to click new. And what type of field am I going to create? Da, 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 da. A formula field. Yes, I'm creating a formula field. So let's tick the formula field. Hit next. What do I do next? I've got to give it a sensible name. Please do not give your custom fields shitty names. Please give your fields sensible names that make sense. And I will love you forever if you do. This is called my formula field. So I'm just going to type in my formula field. 
then look, there's my field name, my API field name, which is automatically filled in. Now look at all of these other options. You can define what type of data is returned by your formula field. So if you're calculating an end date, you will want to return a date. If you are calculating, I mean, I've done formulae that say yes or no. Does this match that? And then I say yes, if not, no. Um, so that'll be a text field. You can do a percentage. You can do a number. You can do currency. You can do a date and time if you want to get real, real, real cute. And you can do a checkbox. Is this ticked? Yes. Or if not, no. So in this instance, what are we going to create? I want to talk to you about what the, so I'm going to, oh, what's it said? What's it saying we've got to do? So we are going to click text. We're going to create a text formula field in our first instance. So we go down and we click text and we hit next. Now, there are two views that you can have for this. Personally, I don't often use this view. I usually go to the advanced view because I want because I create a lot of formulas that get data from other objects through. And the reason the way you can do that is if you have a relationship between two objects, you can kind of go through and collect fields from the related objects. But anyway, now in this instance, because we're beginning, um, you could you I just want to walk you through what these mean. So the simple editor is oh okay so yeah i always use the advanced editor anyway but it but the reason the reason that you would have a simple editor is if you just want to if you just want to create formula fields that are based on um on fields that are on the object you're looking at or if you just want to you know go and get things like the current user or the current user's profile um etc but Advanced formula means you can do more with your formula. So that's why we recommend using that. Uh, on the right hand side, you get a list of all these different functions. So you get a date and time function, logical ones, you get mathematics, you get text and you get nasty, horrible, advanced ones. Um, the insert button opens up a menu. So when you click insert field, this menu comes in and this menu tells you uh, the shape of what you can bring into your formula and really you tend to you don't really tend to use these options very often sometimes you might for validation rules if you only want a rule to run if it's a, if the user's on a certain profile then you might bring in the profile on the system you can actually bring in like you know what you can bring in a date and time stamp for when that record was changed etc uh, you can bring in the current users information you can um, and you can reference custom labels as well so and actually that's good practice as well if you want to display certain things then you can actually and you think those things might change and you want to make it scalable uh, you can actually build your own labels and have them display in this text field if you want to um, anyway uh, you also have, ooh, why do you have that yeah that's for integrations now one thing I want to mention to you you see you have these little greater than symbols that means you're looking at a relationship which means you can get fields from the object that it's related to. So for example, on the account, I'm currently creating this, this formula on the opportunity, but if I wanna go and get data from the account or the account owner, because that might be different, or the DMB company, because that, or the created by, or the parent account, I can go through these relationships to several levels and go and get all this data right now be careful because look what happens you get this great big long list that says okay i'm going i'm on the opportunity i'm going through to the account then i'm going to its parent then i'm going to the owner of that parent then i'm going to the contact of that owner then i'm going to the owner of that contact then i'm going back to the contact again and then i'm going to get the assistant name so that's a very round the houses way to do it and the longer you do that you've only got a certain number of characters that you can have in a formula field so try not to do that. Try to think about how your relationships are how, uh, within between the two objects that you're uh, that you're looking at, um, and just and and think carefully about those relationships there. So for this instance, what are we going to do? We're going to go and get. Oh yeah. Then we also have the. Um, so this is where you go and collect fields. So if I wanted to just display uh, the account type. Um, or the account industry, then I could 
effectively show that on my opportunity and just call it account industry which would mean they don't have to hover over anything they don't have to click open into any accounts they can just see it immediately right there in the formula field and the formulas work in real time as well which means that if the account industry is currently um, consulting and you're viewing an opportunity record and then someone changes it from consulting to um, to oil and gas, you'll see it updated to oil and gas because it happens in real time. You may have to refresh the page, but that's what it is. Um, but you don't have to edit the record to see that information. It's just there. Um, then you have your operators. Your operators are uh, typically your add, subtract, multiply. Multiply is an asterisk in, in the IT world. Divide is a slash. You've got an exponentiation. I wish I could explain better what that means. I will go away and look it up because I don't you see I've never used it. Uh, then you have your open and close brackets. You have concatenate, which is how which concatenate means bring two text values together. So if I want to do first name and last name together, I will often use concatenate because I'll do first name and space um, and next and last name as fields. And then you've got your equals, not equal to, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, ands and ors, etc. Personally, I'm not a fan of using double ampersand and double and double um, pipe for for or and and. I like to write it out because then I know what's going on. Um, it's really down to personal preference, what your style is. Um, if you've been an Excel user, it's kind of like building a formula in Excel, but but not quite. Slight, very slightly off. Um, it was a little learning curve for me coming from Excel into Salesforce and building formulas. Uh, then your function menu is where you put your functions in. So sometimes I, when I'm putting defaults into a date field, I might put, um, I might go in and put a function that is basically now. Now is a function that is, and if I try and check the syntax, it's going to tell me off because I'm creating a text field, but I'm putting in a date formula, a date there. So it will say expected text and got a date. There you go. Formula result is data type incompatible with expected data type text. Okay. Um, so I use those for like default values. I might use them for um, validation rules. Sometimes with validation rules is interesting as well because I uh, validation rules are basically how you can create your own custom error messages. I've written some creative ones in my own org, which is like really if you've learned to time travel. Could you tell us? Could you tell us? If not, please make sure the end date is, um, you know, is is after the start date. <laughs> Stuff like that. So I put some cheeky, some cheeky errors in there. Um, so in this instance, what we're going to do is display the account field on the con. Oh, uh, no. Let's let's try. It. So let's carry on with this instance. So um, remember, I did account, and I wanted to bring through the industry. So what I want you to do is click insert field. And you, remember, you've selected that you're on the opportunity object. So we, if we want to get data from the account, we've got to click on account to open up all the fields that are available on the account. So this is this is for the account that the opportunity is directly related to. So I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to get the industry. It's a pick list, and I'm going to click insert. Now pick lists. This is where pick lists are, there are some nuances in Salesforce to be aware of, and you, you become aware of them over ex, after experience. Um, for pick lists, they're not treated in the same way as many other text fields. If I click check syntax now, it's going to yell at me because I'm trying to return a text field, but it's a pick list. Pick list fields are only supported in certain functions. Yeah, they're one of these nuances. The way I can get around that is I just convert, I, I write in a function that converts that pick list into text and displays it in a text formula field. So I just go text, open bracket, count.industry, close bracket. Let me check the syntax. It should be green. Yes, it's green. So notice how it says compiled size 218 characters. You have a limit to the number of characters in your formula fields. And sometimes if you've daisy chained formula fields together, it will count all the characters in the previous previous formula fields as well. So just watch out. Sometimes you have to change your solution um, to not use formula fields because of those limits. 
I'm just going to hit next. It will ask you about your field level security. Remember, we talked about making fields visible. Um, all formula fields are read only because you can't change them. The only thing you can change is the input values for the formula field. So if I change the industry, that will change the formula field. But what I can do is change at field level who should see that formula field. So I have, and actually I have an example of that. I've got cost rates and, um, and margin rates in my own org um, for my business where I calculate how profitable a project is. And I don't always share that with everybody. Um, I might share the margin percentage, but I don't necessarily want to know how much I'm how much I'm um, actually making from it because because for HR reasons I may actually be looking to ramp somebody's somebody's salary up as I go, and I don't want them getting too upset about the margin that we're making right now because we're new startup, for example. So so we hit if we hit next. So I can hide those fields and then I can open them up to myself using permission sets, which is good practice. Then I decide which page layouts I want my um, formula to appear on. I'm gonna leave it on all of them and I'm gonna hit save. The field is now there. Let's go and have a look at an opportunity. And hopefully we should see the accounts industry being displayed directly on the opportunity through that formula field. I think we will do this after we've done sharing. I will get you to do this and validation rules in 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 anger. So let's go and have a look at Burlington Textiles. Your field will be on the details tab, and there is my formula field, which is about halfway down. So when you've worked in data, you learn to spot things quickly, and it says apparel. Apparel is the industry of the account, which is called Burlington Textiles Corp of America. And you can see that because we put it in the compact layout the other day. Make sense, everybody? Hope so. Okay. So there are other formulas that you can use. Um, we can do a number of days until an opportunity closes. Should we do one quick one quick one in the last five minutes. We are going to create a formula field that calculates the number of days between the end date of a contract and today. And the use case is your renewals team wants to see how many days are left before a contract expires. Now, contract, contract is, don't worry about it, Hannah. We can we can go through it again. Um, I'm only throwing it at you in the last 10 minutes um, just to give you an overview. Um, but we will do some sessions on formulas and validation rules for sure, for definite. Um, this is where your maths and all that algebra that we said we never, we would never need when we were at school. Um, I actually use it most days because of this, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so we get. So what we're going to do with this one is we're going to go to uh, the standard object called contract. Um, so back into our object manager. Contract is a standard object. It's not used very often. It's not uh, because really it doesn't really offer that much. Some people use it, but it just gives you a who signed, what's the account, what's the details on it, and then attach a document. And it just helps people to understand when a contract is due to expire. We are going to go to fields and relationships. And we are going to create a formula field which tells us the number of days remaining on the contract, which is a fairly straightforward um, formula field. We're going to go to new. And we're going to go to formula and we're going to go next. And we're going to select number. And the name of the formula is called days remaining. Can anyone guess what the mathematics would be for this? Just to note as well, when you use formula fields for currencies and numbers, you can change the number of decimal places that are returned as well. So today minus close date, that will tell us, um, yeah, so today minus the end date will be how many, that would give you a negative number because 
That's right, Natasha. So you would use close date minus, you would use close date minus today, I believe. Let me just think. Yeah, that's what I would do. So, so days remaining, you want the, you want, yeah, actually it will be closed. Yeah, it'll be closed date minus today. Correct. So because your closed date's in the future, today's in the past, you want to calculate the days in between. Whereas if you do today minus closed date, if that date is in the future, you're going to get a really weird number, negative number. I think. So we go to days remaining. You see how easy it is to tie yourself up in knots when you're thinking on your feet like this. <laughs> so we are going to get, first of all, we want our contract end date. So we're in the contract object and we want to scroll down and find our contract what are they wanting us to do days remaining end date of a contract yeah so is it end date or is it contract end date it's contract end date so we click that and then we click insert so now that puts in the exact name. I mean, if you want to, if you, you could memorize all the names of these fields and put them in yourself, but I really wouldn't recommend it. I'm much more of a click and grab. So at the moment, all this is going to show is the end date, which is you know, it's going to show an error because this is a number field and we're proposing to put a date in. So to calculate, we all we do is just go today and brackets. I am on the advanced tab, yeah. And then a minus. No. <laughs> well done. Close date minus the day. Okay. Now, the end date of the contract is calculated using a start date plus a number of day, a number of uh, a contract term in months. So it, the system actually calculates the end date. You will find you should find the end date because it's in its list. Its label, its field name is end date, but its label is contract end date. So if you if you open up the insert menu and just look for contract end date, it's just above the ID, and then click insert. Don't worry about it. Um, can someone can someone guide Hannah to the um, formula editor from the enter details page? So we're putting in end date minus today. Then we can add our help text and descriptions like we always would. So the number, right, great shout to your users, the number of days left in this contract. And then when we're ready, we just go to next. Then we have our field level security. Just leave it as it is for now. Hit next. Then we have our page layout. Just met, just it, if you leave that ticked, it will add it to the page layout. And hit save. And now that field is there, done. So I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go and find a contract. In fact, no, I'm going to create a contract. Um, so I'm going to go back to my app menu. I'm going to go to items and click contracts. Now, do we have any out of the box? Let's have a look. No. Let's create one really quickly. So go to new. And we're going to add it to our Burlington Textiles account. So under account name, just clicking it once and all your recently used accounts should appear. So I'm just going to go to Burlington Textiles. I'm going to give it a start date of today. And I'm going to give it a contract term in months. And I'm just going to put 12 months. And that should give it an end date of the 14th of April 2021. Leave everything else blank and hit save because we're just testing our formula at the moment. Go to details and we should see the number of days left in the contract. 364. Your days remaining will always, your new fields will always appear on the left hand side at the, at the bottom of your top section.
Okay. So we are, we've come to the end of our time for today. Um, if you want to drop now, then you're most welcome to. What I think I'll probably do is send out a little feedback form this week. So if you could all keep an eye on your emails, I'll send out a, fee uh, a feedback form. And um, I just want to just want to take the temperature of how we're doing. And if people are learning things, if there's things that we can do better, um, then I would really love to find out because um, I because feedback is a total gift. So thank you, everybody. And also, so is the gift of your time. Thank you very much for coming along and for listening and for learning. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I wish you all a pleasant week. Have fun doing the homework. If you've got any questions, feel free to stay on.